Hello everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. Our guest today here is Mr. Greg Kading, who's a former homicide detective for LAPD. And uh, uh, today we will talk to him the disappearance and death of Elisa Lam, who was a 21 years old girl from Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, she was vacationing in Los Angeles in the first months of 2013, when she was found dead in a water tank of, um, on the roof of the Cecil Hotel in downtown LA. Back then, Mr. Kading was a private investigator and he was involved by another investigator that uh, he was connected to. So thanks for your time, Greg, first of all. You're welcome, good to see you. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how was this case unique if you compare it to others you've been involved with? Well, it was unique because, of course, she was a you know a foreign she was a foreign um, person visiting Los Angeles, and then she just mysteriously disappears for you know a number of days before she's you know finally discovered in that water tank. So it was unique just in the sense that there was you know um, all of the different kind of elements of her disappearance, the fact that she had um, been talking to people during her travels, and there was just some suspicious things about it. And then, of course, the Cecil Hotel has its own very unique history, which raised a lot of questions. So, you know, like with most crimes, they're all kind of unique just because they have their own set of circumstances. Okay. Let's start from the creepy video, which is the most known thing about Elisa Lam's death because we see her in an elevator acting weirdly. Uh, can you rule out that there was somebody else in the video with her trying to maybe threat her or do harm to her? No, there's no evidence to support that. That's just pure speculation. Um, when you look at it and just take the video at, at uh, um, you know, if you just take the video as itself standalone, you do think that maybe there's somebody because she's looking out and then peeking back, you know, ducking back inside and seems to be kind of hiding. So that would be give you the impression that there is possibly somebody in the vicinity. But when you look at it in a more comprehensive, circumspect way, you realize what's happening was just a, uh, a mental breakdown. Okay, because this case will also recently brought to public attention because there's a Netflix TV series about it called The Crime Scene, The Cecil Hotel. And I think that a lot of people at the moment uh, are asking, was the video somehow edited? What are your thoughts about it? Well, yeah, of course it was edited. When the police department got their, uh, got the tapes, the videotapes of the surrounds, they just broke it down into a manageable amount of information that they could release to the media during the attempts to locate her. So, yes, you know, you've got video and you edit it in order to just give excerpts so that the media can put it out on the, you know, on the news in order to try to elicit the public's health. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, public's help. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some truth to that. It wasn't edited for any kind of nefarious reasons. It was edited just you know, for the economy of being able to show something on television. In my understanding, when we see in the video that there are, there's like one minute missing because we see the door closing and it actually like skips some seconds. I thought the reason was that camera only record when there's motion. So in that segment, there was no motion. Therefore, the camera themselves uh, stopped recording. Is this assumption reliable? Does it make sense? It, it, well, it could make sense. That's not the case, though. Um, those weren't motion detected in cameras. Those, those weren't cameras that are activated by motion. They're just a video camera that's constantly monitoring. And so when the police department got the full video, they just broke it down into small pieces so that they could show the public who they were looking for. Okay. What can you tell us about the postmortem examination? Did the body show signs of her having to somehow fight back to somebody? 
No, there was no defense wounds on here. There was no DNA found under her fingernails from scratching at anybody. There was no uh, bruising around the neck from being strangulated. There was no other visible injuries on her. So there was nothing discovered in the autopsy to um, support the idea that she had been assaulted. There was also no, no signs of any kind of uh, sexual activity, recent okay. sexual activity. I think this clears the field from any kind of conspiracy theory. I mean, she killed herself if she had no wounds on her arms, I would say. Yes, uh, but when you say killed herself, she didn't kill herself in the, in the sense that she committed suicide. She just got herself into a situation that she couldn't get out of and so ultimately died as a result of some, some decision making. But of course, that decision making was already complicated by the fact that she was having a delusional ep episode because she hadn't been taking her psychotic me medications, psychiatric oh. medications. That, that's, that's indeed what I meant. And for, thanks for your clarification. Do you think the media pressure had an impact on the investigation? If so, a positive one or a negative one? In this case, most most certainly a negative one only because you know we have to rely law enforcement sometimes has to rely on the public in order to uh, further these investigations to make progress in the investigations you need people's help so information is put out but sometimes the response to that um, can be problematic because you get overwhelmed with bad leads false information distractions and so you've only got a limited amount of resources, and if you're constantly trying to do damage control against all the false information, it's interfering with the progress of the legitimate information, the legitimate leads. So it can be distracting. Okay. Uh, let me ask you something a little bit different. Uh, what struck me in the Netflix TV series is that it seems that from the Cecil Hotel, it, it's very easy to walk into dangerous neighborhood. So for a certain time, investigators thought that she maybe met somebody who might have killed her, maybe for drug deals or something of the sort. So since you're an expert in crime in L.A., I was wondering, is that easy in L.A. to walk from a normal common zone to a dangerous one? Well, it, it is, and it can be. And just like any major city in Los Angeles, it's got its bad areas. It's got its areas where it's dangerous for people who are unfamiliar with that area to be venturing out and, and walking. And so um, this particular case in downtown L.A., this is an area called Skid Row, which is immediately around the Cecil Hotel. And it's just tons of homeless, tons of drug abuse, tons of robberies on the street. It's just a, a very, very depressed and crime-ridden area. And that's exactly with the environment that she was in. And, of course, she wouldn't have known all of these things, um, so she would have been vulnerable. Okay. One striking thing about this case is also what happened to Morbid, the death metal musician from Mexico who was accused by people on the internet of being the killer for absolutely no reason other than having stayed in that hotel like one year before Elisa. What do you think about this case? Well, it's, it's unfortunate, but this is what conspiracy theorists often do. Conspiracy theorists take little pieces and try to use information and interpret information to support their preconceived no notions. So if they have a an idea about what they think happened, they will then use information to support that idea, and oftentimes it's erroneous. Oftentimes they're omitting information that disrupts their conspiracy. And so typically conspiracy theorists aren't objective investigators. They're biased investigators. They already have an idea of what happened, and then they take information and interpret it in a way to support that predetermined idea. And that's what happened with Morbid. You know, they started piecing together little things that were circumstantial that would support the idea that he was involved. But then they completely omit and ignore the information that refutes that theory, such as the fact that he wasn't even there 
in, um, in, in, in that time frame when she disappeared. Indeed. What impact did the internet sleuths, the wannabe internet investigators, have on this case? Well, in this case, the, it fed those conspiracy theorists. So they, uh, it, and sometimes it's reckless and dangerous. And what the problem with most conspiracy theorists is that they end up falsely accusing innocent people, demonstrably innocent people. And uh, they don't take that into consideration. They're too fascinated with their conspiracy to take into consideration the damage that can be done when they're wrong. So that's one of the problems. And in this case, that's what happens, such as was the case with Morbid. Um, but on the other hand, there are times when Internet sleuths and conspiracy, Internet sleuths, I'll just stick with that, um, do good. You know, sometimes police resources are limited and taxed, and so people take it upon themselves to go and investigate things. And sometimes they come up with really good information that helps solve cases. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, documentary called, uh, forgive my language, but the documentary is literally called Don't Fuck With Cats. I am not. And, okay. Yeah, it's a very, very popular documentary, but it was Internet sleuths that helped to find a guy that had posted, uh, you know, the, you know he, had, he had killed some cats online and ultimately ended up murdering a person. And the people that were investigating that from the Internet realm um, were very helpful. Okay, that that's something very interesting because so uh, internet sleuths are not always, uh, you know, to blame. Sometimes they, they, they no, they can be useful. Okay, yeah. thanks again for your time, Greg. I, I hope that this interview can give some light to this very uh, disturbing and interesting case, at least to my viewers. So, thanks again for your time, and uh, goodbye, everybody, and see you next time. Thanks, Leo.